It is the Martha Zoller Show, and we're going to be talking a lot about what happened at UGA, what happened at Emory, at all these universities across the country. This is not the first time this has ever happened. You always have to be careful when you say it's the worst it's ever been because there's always historical things that have happened that could be worse or similar or it's just not in your memory. Like so we've got to keep that, that thing there. Uh, joining me right now is Mike Freeman, who is a longtime member of the community, a retired pastor, a Rotarian, and all of the fun things there, and an author. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Martha. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. So you have a new book out called yeah. Executive Order Number 9066, and we were laughing about the fact you threw me off because you're writing in your official name, Solace Freeman. Yes. Not, as everybody knows you, Mike Freeman. Yes. Yes. One in the same. One in the same. <laughs> okay. And there's no fake name here. This is not no, a pen no. name. No, no, it's not a pen name. It's my f- a born to name. Yes. Yes, that's <laughs> right. That's right. So... Tell me about Executive Order Number 9066. That talks about the order that President Roosevelt did, signed, he, some say reluctantly, that enabled the Army to put over 127,000 Japanese Americans in internment camps right after uh, Pearl Harbor. And so what led you to want to write this story now? I'd always heard about the story. I didn't know a lot about it. I don't think we teach it much in our history. Uh, and I talked with a couple of people, and they didn't even know anything at all about it. I said, okay, I want to I want to bring it up to people, but I don't want to just write a history book because that's got sort of a limited appeal. I wanted to write a novel that would attract a broad base of people. And in the midst of the novel, I wanted to put a flavor of the history of what it meant for these people. So my sister taught for 40 years uh, in social studies in middle school. God bless her. And uh, one of the classes she taught was in, was a advanced class in history that she used historical fiction to teach the ah, history. Okay, yeah. Because she found that the kids would be more engaged, they would read the books, and that she could use the books to be able to teach the history. And this was back in the day when you could ask kids to buy books and you could do all this kind of stuff, you know. But she was she created this curriculum, and I've always loved historical fiction for that reason because it spurs me to go say, okay, what about this is true? What about it is not true? And, and what does it really mean? Yeah, okay. So to do the book, I actually did weeks and weeks of research um, almost all on the internet. Uh, You can find anything on the internet about it. I knew a little bit about it. I didn't know all the details. I didn't know the whole series of how things happened and stuff like that. So everything in the book that they were, the the people who were picked up from this group in San Francisco went first to what was called an assembly center because the internment camp, they picked them up so quickly, the internment camps weren't ready yet. So they said, you'll be in the assembly center for a little while and then we'll move you to the internment camp. The assembly center for this group was Tanferan Racetrack, and they put them up in horse stalls for several months. I mean, they had whitewashed them over. They put some linoleum down, but it was horse stalls. Uh, And then they moved them from there, finally, to the internment camp uh, in Utah, which was out in the desert. Uh, so that's that's all of those all of the the facts about those two things the assembly center uh, and the internment camp are are true. Everything else is just a, a fictional novel. Well, and I think too on this particular issue, you're right that um, we don't teach it like we should because I found my experience in learning history in in um, K through 12 anyway, is that you'd run out of time about the time World War II started. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Sure. And, and And then all of a sudden they went to like, you know, they'd skip from there to, to some current events and you always miss this gap. And so that's been a gap I've been filling in for myself for a long time. And it, it became sort of a pattern that the school would run out of time, you know, about about the beginning of World War II, because there's sure. a lot, and there's a lot that happened between World War II and now. Yeah, I mean, because history's <clears throat> speeding up, right? right? I think I feel like it is. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just because I'm living in it. It feels that way, but I find it very interesting. I feel the same way about um, uh, American Indian Indian history. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's it's not something I know that much about, other than what 
you know, briefly you've read. And it's something I'm working on now, just doing a little more digging about. Because there are, um, you know, there are stories that, that we don't tell for a lot of reasons. I don't think they're all nefarious. I no, think it's just no. time, yep. relationship. It doesn't relate maybe to what people are experiencing at the time, that kind of thing. I think this, you know, you mentioned to me off air that you were number one in new books on Amazon. Congratulations for that. Thank you. But I think this, with what's going on <clears> in the world, this story is an important one to tell right now because we've had a rise in anti-Semitism. We have, because of that, we've had an interest in World War II history or what led up to World War II kind of thing. And then I think that just because the Pacific, the Pacific theater of World War II was so large geographically, yes, it's very hard to follow. It's much easier, easier to follow the European side, and I don't think it's for the racial reasons that a lot of people want to put on it. I think it's as much about that it's geographically more familiar and it's closer and it's smaller and more defined, so it was easier to follow. Yeah, and and we sort of have a lot more historical roots to Europe Mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. we do to the Pacific, although that's a big part of our world now. Yes. But sure, that makes sense. And in general, this population... (laughs) <laughs> is a follow the rules population. You know, oh, the absolutely. Asian population, yes. they follow the rules. They, um, you know, I remember meeting a long time ago a, uh, a a Marine sergeant who was of Japanese heritage. She was American, but she was Japanese heritage. And she goes, believe me, when I told my parents I wanted to be a Marine, they were not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. in our culture, you went to college and you... You, you know, or you went to the family business. That was one of those two things. So um, it was very interesting. But what do you hope people get out of this book? Well, first of all, I hope they enjoy the novel because it is a story. It's a fictional story, but it's a story of a family. And it's a story of a particular, the the young adult male in the family. Uh, So there's the... uh, there's the, the grandparents who are actually Japanese. They moved here from Japan. Uh, then there's the father who is the son of those that couple and the mother who is a Caucasian uh, from Oklahoma City. And then there are the two children, uh, Gerald and his sister. And so what I do is I take, take the reader through uh, from the time they learn that they're going to be uh, taken away and they had six days to get ready to go, and they could take what they could carry, period. So think about that for a minute. Somebody gives you six days, and they're going to take you away, and you can't do anything with what's left behind. They lost their homes. They lost their jobs. A lot of of them lost their businesses. And so I take them through that experience of being picked up, take to the assembly center where they have to live in a horse stall, and then to go out into the middle of this Utah desert, which goes from below zero to 110, and the winds are constant, and just that experience of what they live and just and how they sort of adapt to it and what they do, and uh, and then the the young the son gets so angry when his grandparents are killed by the weather that he escapes and decides he's going to go be a spy against America. So that's the sort of the interesting twist on it. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting read. I'm about halfway through it, so I'll okay. I'll get to the end. Don't give anything away. Nope. And um, you know, I think it's important and we do have a very robust writing community here in Northeast Georgia. Yeah, and I want to talk a little bit about that. They're called the Northeast Georgia Writers or Northeast Georgia Literary Society. I'm a member of that, and they were so helpful in helping me do this book because I'm not a writer. I didn't start writing until COVID. So you can tell how old I am and how (laughs) it was a late-life idea. So they've been a wonderful group. Uh, You can find them on NEGALiterarySociety.org. So if you're interested in writing or books, check us out. So are you still pastoring at all? Oh, no. No, no. I'm totally retired. Totally retired. Yep. So except they probably you get invited to do the occasional funeral. 
<laughs> Isn't that interesting? I just did two funerals in the last two months yes. for two friends of mine who were both in the military. Yes. And yes. because I was military chaplain yes. and friends of theirs asked. But that's Absolutely. it. That's it. Yeah. I, that's that's kind of how people roll out, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mike Solace Freeman, yeah. the, book, the book is Executive Order Number 9066. A great read. I'll let you know when I finish it, and we'll have a lot of fun. Thank you for being with me today. Okay. Thank you. I enjoyed it.